Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we are with us Dr. Eric Eckhart, the Director of Research and Development at Adair Biome. So Eric, before we start, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Yeah, hi, so my name is Eric Eckhart. I'm R&D Director at Adair Biome. Uh, I joined the company in September 2021. Um, before that, I worked for about 11 years in the industry, so on uh, solutions for digestive health of uh, humans uh, and later production animals, monogastrics uh, mainly. Uh, but I, I'm a biochemist by uh, formation and have spent, uh, before joining the industry, I've spent about 13 years in academia doing research mainly on the interaction between diet, microbiome and the intestinal immune system and how this relates to, uh, to health. So here at the, at the Dara Biome, we produce uh, postbiotics, and we've been doing this for more than a century. And so I think we might be the, the true pioneers of postbiotics in a way. Uh, our product, our main product consists of a fermentation product of two uh, proprietary lactobacillus strains that after fermentation are heat treated, so they're no longer replicated. And then they're, they're dried together with the spent metabolite rich culture medium. So as such, we really uh, are compliant with the uh, definition of postbiotics that was uh, refined in 2021 by the International Scientific Association for Pre- and Postbiotics as being um, inanimate microorganisms that confer or fragments thereof that confirm, confer a health benefit to the host. Great. So I read that study you sent us recently about the lactobacillus fermentate during an F18 challenge in the nursery and then comparing it to a bacitration treatment and looking at all sorts of parameters like intestinal health, growth efficiency, microbiota levels, etc. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that study? Yeah, sure. So this study was uh, performed by Professor sung Kim at North Carolina State University, who uh, tested our uh, albiotics, uh, postbiotic uh, for the um, mitigation of health uh, problems uh, induced by a challenge with F18 positive E. coli. So our uh, postbiotic uh, has been used for a long time, actually over a, dec- over a uh, century, uh, for digestive health in, in humans. And so we wanted to see if this product could also play a positive role in the resilience of production animals towards the various challenges that they face. So we had obtained some preliminary data with F4 positive E. coli uh, challenge um, models with wean pigs, uh, which were very positive. So we wanted to also do this in F18 uh, E. coli challenge model, uh, and then look into more into uh, into mode of action data. So uh, as you know, there is a very strong uh, relation between nutrition and health. So on one hand, uh, the animal needs proper nutrition to develop optimal resilience towards the many challenges it faces and then also of course to um, show good growth but it's also the other way around where a healthy intestine is uh, very important for proper digestion of nutrition and to incorporate it into the uh, valuable muscle muscle tissue that we all consume so um what we uh, what what was done in this study was um so weaned freshly weaned pigs they were put on three different types of diets so one was a control diet with no supplemental material added. The other diet contained uh, a growth promoter right from, from the start, in this case, uh, zinc bacitracin. And the third diet contained our, uh, our postbiotic right from, from weaning. And at day seven, the animals were challenged with uh, F18 E. coli to induce um, uh, diarrhea. But half of the control animals on control diet did not receive a uh, challenge, so they served as a, as a negative control of sorts. Now, uh, this particular challenge was not very strong, so there was some diarrhea, but it was not very um, pronounced, not as strong as we had seen before in our F4 challenge uh, studies. Um, but there was a significant drop in performance after the challenge, so indicating that these animals had uh, um, impaired digestive health and had trouble assimilating the diet and also probably used a lot of the energy to uh, to fend off the E. coli. But uh, the animals that had received the growth promoter and also the albiotics postbiotic, the albiotics postbiotic um, they had a better growth performance, almost uh, as good as the negative controls. 
Um, the, the diarrhea was not very strong in the study, but um, and, and the group of uh, Dr. Kim they looked at the jejunum of these animals and they found that there was uh, uh, inflammation, apparent inflammation in the challenged animals, which was less pronounced in those that received our postbiotic or the um, or the antibiotic. Um, that was uh, that was illustrated by the fact that there was less interleukin eight in these tissues in, in both treatment groups, and also less proliferation of crypt cells, uh, which is an indication that there was less need for repair of these tissues. So um, overall, we were very uh, pleased, of course, with this with this study because it confirmed our previous um, studies and it showed that, uh, like it had done with humans for a long time now. Uh, the postbiotic uh, might also be uh, of value for production animals. So a uh, last piece of uh, interesting information from this study was actually that there seemed to be a quite a pronounced effect of the uh, of our postbiotic on the microbiome that is associated with the jejunal mucosa. So we knew already from the past that our um, lactobacillus fermentate has a affinity for the jejunal mucosa. But now we also saw that um, the material actually seemed to have induced a, an increased richness of the microbiome in that area. So um, this is always a good sign. We've also seen um, more lactobacilli, live lactobacilli associated with the uh, jejunal mucosal tissue. And this is interesting because these are, um, of course, beneficial bacteria that's also um, that help shape the, uh, the intestinal tract and may also help um, increase the resistance towards um, uh, colonization of pathobions. So this, this local effect on the jejunal mucosa is, is, I think, one of the very interesting findings in this study. And it, it helps us um, further uh, develop uh, studies to, to look more into the um, uh, mode of action of our product. Awesome. So one question I had when like reading this, so with this being, and you addressed it, I guess, a little bit um, before the beginning as well, but with this being a postbiotic and not a typical or what you normally see in pigs with a prebiotic or a probiotic, um, how does that work differently than the prebiotic and probiotic in the pig when it comes to like how it functions in the gut and how it pig utilizes it as a nutrient? Yeah, sure. So our postbiotic is a, a product of fermentation of two uh, proprietary lactobacillus strains, which are then um, heat inactivated at the end, and they are then dried together with their spent metabolite-rich culture medium. So as such, it's it's a, it's a true uh, postbiotic, which um, as recently defined by the International Scientific Association for Pre and Postbiotics, is a uh, inanimate uh, microorganism or fragments thereof uh, that confers a benefit to the host. So it really fulfills this, um, this uh, definition. And um, these the cells that are in this preparation are no longer living, so they do no longer replicate. Probiotics, on the other hand, they by definition need to be alive when they uh, are administered. And they, um, they also then need to survive the, the stomach and become active in the GI tract. Uh, where they produce metabolites and, and exert other functions. So in our case, this is not required. The, 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 the bacterial bodies are already dead and the metabolites have already been formed and it's part of the product. The prebiotics, um, uh, the concept is that you need to um, stimulate beneficial bacteria that are already present in the intestine. Now, prebiotics, uh, it's, an, it's an attractive concept, but you need to make sure that the good bacteria are already there that's one and second you need to be sure that uh, potentially less uh, beneficial bacteria or even, even harmful bacteria don't metabolize the same product so so that and um, to come back to the probiotics uh, one another important um, difference with probiotics is that the that the bacterial bodies in our product they don't need to colonize and, and replicate locally uh, because um, they're already dead and they are they're applied in sufficient amounts so these are the the main fundamental differences between the pro um, uh, the, the postbiotics on one hand and the pro and pre excuse me prebiotics on the other hand. Uh, yes, I appreciate you coming on the show and sharing that study with us. Sure, uh, my pleasure.
And everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com. And we would love to talk about your research. See you later.